Welcome to Service Georgina on Rogers TV. I'm Mayor Margaret Quirk. Our goal is to bring you information to help you understand more about the many services and departments of the town of Georgina. Today's show will focus on the building department and in particular, building permits. Joining me now is Devin Delabal, Supervisor of Inspections and Deputy Chief Building Official for the Development Services Department. Welcome, Devin. Well, thank you, Mayor Quirk. Good to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you on the show. And I know we've discussed uh, these uh, topics before, but again, with many people spending more time at home during the pandemic, a lot of people are looking at doing some renovations, whether it's interior or whether it's exterior. And, but they may never have done a, a building project before and just wonder where to start and what permits are needed and how to apply. So let's see if we can help them out today with uh, some, some more information. What would be the first steps for someone who's considering a building project like a deck or a pool or an interior project? So we have a lot of clients uh, every year that uh, come in wanting to build uh, some of these kind of, we say, summer projects or fall projects. Um, the first thing you're going to want to do is contact the building division to determine if a permit is in fact required. Um, there are certain things uh, that don't require permit. Lots of things do. Uh, and it's always better to check with us first. You know, you can tell us exactly what your proposal is, give us some details. Uh, we have staff here in the building that'll respond uh, back to you. You give us some specific information and we'll give you back some, uh, some details. So what does it require a permit? You sort of alluded that there's some things that, that don't, what would require a permit? If I'm putting up a fence or uh, a shed, what would require a permit and what wouldn't? Right. So um, if you uh, if you wanted to construct a shed on your property under 10 square meters, which is about 107 square feet, uh, you don't require a building permit for that. Uh, another example would be a, a small freestanding deck uh, that is less than uh, 24 inches high. Uh, that that also doesn't require a permit. Uh, fencing that you mentioned um, does not generally require a building permit. Uh, however, you know, any of these projects you are going to be subject to other municipal regulations, other governing bodies. Um, for example, if you're regulated by the Lake Simcoe Region Conservation Authority, your shed may not require a building permit, but you may want to contact them. And we have some resources on our website that you can look at um, to see if uh, you're in their regulated area, just using them as an example. Um, so it, it is always best just to check with us. And then even if you don't need a permit, we can advise you uh, on some steps you still do want to take. Right, and and it's good to give all the details that you that you have at the time. If there's things you're just thinking about doing, or you don't want to tell the town you're you're doing this, maybe you just want to find out something. But I, I guess what I'm saying is it's good to get all the details out on the table, what you're looking at doing, so that that you know you can be advised properly, no surprises down uh, down the road. So, what other projects like a a minor interior renovation. If, if I'm redoing a bathroom, um, do I have to get uh, a permit? Yeah, so generally, if you were going to redo your bathroom in your home, um, if you're just replacing the fixtures, taking out the toilet, the sink, and the tub, and putting the same back in, or taking out your tub and putting in a tiled uh, shower, uh, that's not going to require a building permit. A building permit would be required when you start moving the actual plumbing piping, the drains, the water lines, uh, things of that nature. And uh, there's some other things in your home too that uh, people may uh, wonder about. Um, shingling your roof. Uh, generally, you don't need a permit if you're going to be shingling your roof. That's, that's not required. Uh, even if you strip the shingles off your roof and you find there's a small area of plywood maybe that's gotten wet uh, from the roof leaking, you can replace that. It's just considered a repair. It's not structural and you don't need a building permit from, for that. Now, if you rip your shingles off and you find that the roof is rotting because it's been leaking for a long time, then you're going to want to get a building permit. And especially now with technology, you can always take a photo of it, send it to our staff. We can have a look at it if it's something you're not sure of, and uh, we can advise you. So there is lots of little things that you don't need a permit for. Great. That's good information. I hadn't thought of the roof. That That's a good one. Now, what do I have to have ready when I submit my uh, my permit application for my project? Right. Uh, so there is a process that you go through. Uh, you're going to have a building permit application, uh, which is a form that's available uh, online right now. 
um, you're going to have to have a site plan showing you know the location of what you're proposing to build if it's that shed we talked about earlier where on the property exactly are you locating it how big is it uh, and you're going to have some construction details outlining you know um, how high is it you know some elevations uh, what's the foundation like what are the walls constructed out of and the roof um, so these are some details that you need to submit to us with your application uh, to apply for the permit. So how detailed do they need to be? Because if, again, if this is the first time I've ever done a, a, a project, do I have to hire a, a, an engineer or a contractor or a design, somebody to put the plans in, or can I sketch it out? How, how detailed do they need to be? Um, they, they do need to be quite detailed. Um, you know, you have to provide, you have to provide dimensions. You have to tell us the size of the lumber. Um, if you're planning on building that shed, uh, we'll, we'll use that as an example on your own. You, you can probably, if you have the knowledge to build it yourself, you may have the knowledge to complete the drawings. Um, some of our, you know, our staff may give you some assistance, uh, online or over the phone advising you of the type of details. But if you just keep in mind, you know, how you would construct it. If you can put that level of detail clearly, that's understandable down on paper, then you should be able to do it yourself. If you can't do that, if you're not building it yourself, your builder can probably help you. Uh, they may have a qualified designer that can do the plans for you. Okay, good to know. So last year, somewhat because of the pandemic, we started doing more of the application process online. And can you tell us what's changing in that process to make it even more user-friendly? Right. So uh, as you know, with the onset of the pandemic, a lot of the corporation services uh, moved to online, including the building divisions. Uh, up until this point, we've been largely uh, using email. You could email in your application, get the uh, application form off the website and send it to us with your plans. Um, we are going to be rolling out an online portal soon. Um, the portal has some advantages in that uh, it'll guide the customer through the process. Uh, it's going to be a learning curve for the customers, just like it is for us, and it's not quite ready yet, but we're hoping that it'll um, eliminate some of the back and forth we have with people uh, so that the process is quicker, you know, and that it'll kind of take you step by step through what you need to do. Is uh, the ability to, to make the payment for the building um, permit, is that available online yet, or is that still um, sort of an in-person drop-off type of situation? It's that's still a little ways away. We're hoping to have that uh, one day, but at this point, uh, we receive your application. An application or examiner uh, reviews it, and provided we have enough information to go ahead, we send you an invoice. You can drop the payment off at the civic center uh, with a copy of the invoice. Um, for some things, you can also uh, go online. Uh, not go online. Sorry, you can also phone the civic center. And, uh, and you can pay over the phone. Oh, okay, good. that's good to know. That's an option for some things, not- For something, not everything. Not everything. And that's a game where you have to make sure you make those calls and get that information clearly when you first start. Right, if you have a deposit to make with the town, uh, for some reason, to, deposits cannot be paid on the phone. Oh, okay. Yeah. So how long does it typically take for a permit to be issued? Uh, we, we like to say four to six weeks to give time for the permit to go through its whole process. Uh, sometimes it can be a little bit quicker for some of the smaller projects. Uh, and also, uh, if you've applied for a permit before and you're familiar with the process, that usually makes it a little bit quicker. But four to six weeks is a good guide for anything for a, a pool or, or a deck, uh, all the way up to a, a house or an addition. Okay, good. Um, so I, I put in my application. What what happens next? Do I sit and, and, and wait? How do somebody contact me? What's the next steps after I put my application in? Yeah, once you've applied for a permit, currently using uh, building at Georgina.ca is our uh, email uh, page. Uh, once you've applied, an application examiner will review it. Um, they will let you know if we need further information to proceed or if it's complete. Uh, complete enough for us to review. We will uh, advise you uh, of the fee that's owing and send you an invoice. Once you've made payment, we'll then forward it on uh, for further review. So you had said before that, um, you know, that this new portal will, will help sort of alleviate some of the, the, the back and forth. Because I know, you know, I submit something, somebody says, oh, you're missing that, it goes back. 
and that that back and forth. Um, is there a, a checklist that people can can review to to make sure they've got everything on there so that there isn't that time lag of of delays? Yes, we have some checklists. Uh, they're not necessarily available right now through the portal, but if you uh, contact our staff ahead of time, uh, we can give you a checklist based on what you tell us you're wanting to do. We can give you some details, and then you can kind of go through that checklist as you're making your application. And the portal does assist you in some ways too. It's going to advise you to upload certain things. Um, whether or not you know uh, exactly what those things are, it, you know, you still may want to call us. Yeah, and you can do a, a call or even a Zoom um, call if if you need to to do that. I, I understand you you'll you're willing to try to help people as much as you can. Sure. Yep. Phone, Zoom, email. We'll do anything we can to help the public. So, what other issues need to be addressed when someone's uh, applying for a permit? You alluded to uh, the conservation authority, but is there other things like, for example, with a pool permit? Yes. So, I mean, the Conservation Authority is a common one uh, that many things need approval for. The other one is from our Development Engineering Division, and it's uh, a site alteration and entrance permit. And so many different projects require their approval as well. Um, they probably uh, can give some information to the public. Um, they're going to be rolling out their own portal. Okay. Uh, and you'll be able to make application with them online as well. Good. Good. So after the zoning examiner, what, what's next? Once you've gone through your zoning review for compliance with the zoning bylaw, you then go on to the Ontario Building Code review. Uh, and that's when we're going to make sure that you've, your plans comply with the building code. You've got all the details needed. Uh, and if we can issue the permit at that point, we will. So what can delay a permit from being granted? You had said there's usually four to six weeks, but are there reasons that may take longer? Yeah, um, you know, if the if the if the fees not uh, paid, if the plans are are not adequate, um, sometimes those approvals from other agencies such as conservation or development engineering, uh, they can slow you down. You know, if there's other things you have to do that are outside of our control. Okay, what are the pitfalls if you don't get a permit? Because I know a lot of people say, ah, "I'm not going to bother with the permit; it takes too long." What can happen if you don't get a permit? Right. I mean, if you don't get a permit, um, for starters, it's a health and safety issue. We want everyone to follow the building code uh, and get a permit. And um, you can have a double fee applied to your permit. Uh, you might have to take the structure down uh, or modify it. There's a lot of extra costs that can be incurred. But thanks, Devin, for, for all the information. We're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, I'll be joined by Michael Voss as we learn more about the town's ash tree removal program. I'm Mayor Margaret Quirk, and this is Service Georgina on Rogers TV. Welcome back. I'm Mayor Margaret Quirk, and this is Service Georgina on Rogers TV. Joining me now is Michael Voss, and we're going to talk about the, town, the town's EAB program, and we'll explain just what that is. Thanks for joining me today, Michael. Thanks for having me. So let's get to the basics first. What is EAB? EAB is a, uh, a short form reference for the emerald ash borer. Uh, the emerald ash borer is a uh, highly invasive uh, insect that uh, uh, preys on any species of ash tree uh, and essentially can kill the ash tree within one to three years of invading. So how did we get this lovely little creature? <laughs> uh, well, it, it's uh, it's it's traveled up from uh, from southern Ontario um, through a, ver a variety of means, um, uh, most of which uh, are from the movement of of lumber and the movement of of wood uh, into our region. Um, it's been in the, in uh, York region since about uh, 2011, 2012, uh, and we've been fighting it ever since. Yeah, and it's not native to uh, to even uh, Ontario or Canada, correct? It it came in from. Other places? Uh, yeah, I believe so, yeah. Yeah, so I know one of the things that, that at this council and at regional council, we've expressed the concern that as the, the last level of, of government, we're the ones paying the bill for, for the impacts of the Emerald Ash Borer, and yet from a federal side of things, they're supposed to protect our, our borders from invasive species, which, which this being one has, has had a, a huge impact. 
So anyway, I digress. It's, it's, it's a, a sore point for many of us when it comes to the financial impact. So Definitely. what have been the impacts of the town as a whole and to town properties such as parks and, and road allowances? Like it's, it's a huge impact. Maybe you can tell us like how many trees that we've cut and how many we have left, left to be removed. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's been detrimental over the past uh, decade uh, to, the, to the town's canopy. Uh, it's, it's, it's quite unfortunate. We, so we have about um, uh, 5,000 ash trees uh, in our inventory um, uh, back in uh, it, when it was conducted in, in 2014. Since then, uh, it's been a slow removal progress uh, through various uh, initiatives, both capital and operating. Um, and, and today we've taken down about 1,200 uh, uh, ash trees. Um, to and, you know that that doesn't come that's not free uh, that that's been approximately seven hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars of removals since then that's not including any replanting efforts. Replanting, yeah, and it and it really does impact when you go through some of the uh, the parks and you see the amount of trees that were were cut down. You, you didn't realize that those lovely big trees that, that we all enjoyed were, were ash trees. And as you say, once they're infected, it's very hard to uh, to save uh, the trees. What are the steps for the for the tree removal? How do we track this and monitor it? Yeah, so to, to um, not get into too much detail, um, we we assess the trees on an annual basis and come up with a basically a risk profile for each of our our trees. Um, create a priority list for removals and then conduct the removal process, which includes um, uh, identification by town staff and monitoring. Um, issuance of a work order to a contractor or in-house town staff, depending upon the size of the of the tree, uh, and then uh, the removal is conducted. At that point, a stump would be left over. We would conduct stumping within a specified time frame within that contract, and then uh, beyond that would be the the replanting process, which is a bit of a, a separate process unto itself. So when we go out and, and do that inspection, will we mark the trees that uh, need to be removed? And I know I've seen different colors circles. Mm -hmm. Like, is there a color that we use and a color that the region uses? Yeah. So in, in terms of the tree identification, uh, each ash tree that's inspected does get us assigned a, uh, an ash identification number. Um, and the, the trees won't be uh, necessarily marked at the time of inspection. They will be marked uh, at the time of removal. So that would be kind of the... Uh, We've come back to the office, we've assessed the results, we've put the next year's program into place. Um, and at that point, then staff would go out into the field and, and identify uh, uh, the trees for removal. Typically, from the, from, the, um, uh, from the town's point of view, it would be a, a large R uh, painted in orange paint. That's, uh, that typically denotes uh, a town-initiated uh, uh, program. Okay, because I know I get residents asking me what the marks on, on the trees mean and, and different organizations have marked the trees uh, differently. And you said earlier, this has had a huge impact on, on our tree canopy and, and the replacements <clears throat> aren't free. And you uh, alluded to uh, the, the costs uh, so far to, to remove the trees. What's the this town strategy to replace those trees? And what do those costs look like? <laughs> uh, also not free. <laughs> um, so uh, the, the town uh, uh, endeavors to, to uh, uh, replace trees uh, on a one-to-one -one basis um, uh, as per our, our uh, replacement uh, strategy uh, that was um, outlined, I believe, in, in 2017. Um, this isn't always possible, especially as it relates to some, uh, some rural ash trees that are removed more out of uh, uh, safety for, you know, roadway safety and, and that type of thing. Uh, but largely those that are removed in urban, semi-urban roadside environments, uh, in parks, that type of thing, are going to be uh, uh, replaced on a one-to-one -one basis with a, uh, a more, more diverse species. So you won't have these monocultures of a whole park is just ash trees. It will be a diverse spe uh, a grouping of maybe uh, six to 10 different species of trees within that park. And the same goes for, for urbanized neighborhoods as well. Yes, yeah, I know there was a couple streets in the south end of Keswick that were very much so uh, ash trees. So when they died, they all died. And it's, it's quite an impact. So are we looking at, you said, a variety of, um, of trees to, to replace? And I know with some of the climate change issues that are happening, certain trees, we have to be careful about the future of, of uh, the trees that we do plant. So are there particular varieties that we're looking at? Uh, there are. There's a, there's a lengthy list, which I, I won't go into, but it's, <laughs> we have to look at a number of things in terms of climate resiliency, but also also like uh, pest resiliency. So 
you know, if it, if, it, if it was an ash tree every third or fourth uh, a tree, would it, they, they would have a little bit more of a fighting chance than if every, every tree beside each other were, were ash. So we have, to, we have to focus on those types of things as well when we're t- thinking about diversity. Right. So we made a, a, a somewhat of a big change to the EAB program in the 2022 budget. Can you outline what those changes are and, and why we uh, chose to go uh, that route? Absolutely. So, so the, the, as the uh, emerald ash borer kind of progresses through a community, um, the trees will take you know anywhere from three to five years to actually fully decay and die. And and we're we're starting to see we had a, a bit of a slow approach uh, at the beginning of you know when we we're trying to understand what the impacts were to our community. We're kind of at the getting getting closer to the tail end of that five years in the, in a number of spots throughout the community. And like I said, we've. We've taken care of some of the higher priority trees, but we, now we need to take care of the bulk lot of, of the remaining trees. And that's why we've enhanced the program in, in uh, 2022 um, to take out uh, uh, all of the remaining trees over a three-year period. So that's the remaining approximately 4,200 trees that need to be removed over the next couple of years. And that's you know uh, largely out of, uh, uh, out of risk and, and liability protection for the town um, because We've we've had a number of uh, uh, you know large windstorms in the in the past little while, and, and we're seeing a lot more of these trees fall. So we we have to take the necessary steps now, uh, given that we're we're kind of at the end of the time frame for these trees at this point. Well, yeah, and as you say, the, a lot of them can be very large with which large limbs, and and very worrisome to uh, to to us as a as a corporation from a risk point of view, and and to the residents that that see them either near their property or in the parks that, uh, that they walk through. So what sort of budget did we put towards um, this program? So uh, in, in 2022, uh, Council fortunately approved a, a $1.1 million budget just specific to the Emerald Ash Borer Program or the, the Ash Tree Removal Program. Um, and that will run for approximately three years. Um, what residents can expect to see a, a, as part of that budget is in the first year, a large amount of removals. And then in the, in the consecutive years following a, a hybrid of removals and plant and replanting. So when you say a, a large um, removal, certainly um, I was driving along uh, Lake Drive the other day and Metro Road and saw the removal happening at uh, Willow Beach. Um, it, it's almost like it's going to be a all hands on deck and you go in and you really concentrate in, in an area. Is that what we're looking at in terms of instead of just picking some trees here and there, we're going to go into an area and really concentrate on that, that area? Absolutely. Our, our, our priority at this point is, is volume and, and to take care of the program once and for all and then replant the program once and for all. So uh, uh, residents uh, can expect to receive um, you know, mailed notices ahead of the program being in their area, uh, signage on the roadway when, when, there, when there is equipment and manpower uh, uh, working within the area. Um, and uh, uh, you know, we're, we're really going to try and get ahead of the communication piece to make sure that everyone's aware of what's happening. But it's, it is going to be more of a blanket type removal program this time around. Yeah, and and no, I know that many people are are concerned about the dead ash trees on their own property and some trees that they may feel either are or are not on town property in terms of a road allowance. How do we determine what's on our property and what's on an individual's private residential lot, for example? So, so as I mentioned before, we 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 have done a, a pretty thorough assessment of uh, of the ash trees uh, throughout the town. Um, and identified uh, most uh, um, that fall within the towns right away. Um, we use a, a variety of other tools in terms of measurements from our, our existing uh, our roadway, um, uh, existing uh, subdivision drawings or engineering drawings, uh, property stakes. And if if there is ever you know a debate that that we can't solve, um, we we have uh, uh, obtained surveys as well in field surveys uh, to determine. Yeah, because certainly it is very costly. What's it cost to take down? you know, an average size ash tree, what's the, the cost? <laughs> it, it is, it is difficult to pinpoint uh, individual costs. And, and this is, um, this is one of the, uh, uh, the re- sorry, I, I guess to answer your question, it, it can be, you know, anywhere, if it's a large enough tree, a thousand to $1,500. But when we talk about this type of program, this is a dedicated resources to a large scale program. Those costs come significantly oh, lower yeah. because we're on such a volume scale that they can have, you know, 10 people working and get a hundred trees down in that day type of thing. Right. So it's, yeah, the, the, the scale really is important to what that yeah. cost per tree removal is. 
certainly from a, a private landover owner's point of view, though, when they're coming, someone's coming in to take down one or two ash trees off of their property, it can be thousands uh, of, of dollars for, for them. And that goes back to my concern initially about we're the ones left uh, dealing with, uh, with the, uh, the whole issue of the financial. Now, you talked about um, the replanting. That will be the next stage. So the first, next couple of years are going to be focused on removing the trees. And then we're going to focus in on the, the replanting. Is that what you're saying? That's, that's correct. So phase one, which is 2022, uh, will be a lo- large scale removals and only some minor plantings from previous years. In, in phase two and three, which is 2023-24, you'll, you'll see a hybrid of uh, uh, large scale removals and then some, some replantings from the previous year. And that will kind of roll Great. over each year. Yeah. So if residents need more information, Michael, the best place to go is the, the website and then customer service? Absolutely. Georgina.ca slash EAB is the, the hot link for, for uh, customer service. Yeah. Great. Thank you. This has been a really informative uh, um, session and uh, thank you for, for being on this with me today. I'm Mayor Margaret Quirk and this has been Service Georgina on Rogers TV. See you next time.